Hi, everyone. This is Shelly Stone from the Indian Partnership Against Cancer. Thank you for joining us. So it's 1 o'clock now. John, do you want to um, start it and introduce our speaker? Sure. Okay. Well started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. John Shrigley, the pathology advisor at the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and the chief of lab medicine and genetics at Trillium Health Partners. On of CPAC, CC, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's cancer protocol education session on kidney cancer. The topic was last discussed uh, at a presentation in February 2011, and clearly a lot of stuff's happened in the field of kidney cancer between then and 2018. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, speaker and get underway, I'd like to take a, a care of a few housekeeping items. First, the session is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be circulated to all participants via email when it becomes available. Both presentation and recorded presentation are eligible for CME credits. Information for obtaining credits can be found in the session notice. Please note that the CME certificates for each education session will only be issued for one month, uh, one month from the presentation date. Please refer to the session notice for the exact deadline and date. Please, everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. We have a large number of participants and will not be able to troubleshoot WebEx issues as part of this call. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please call the WebEx support line. Please to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature within WebEx. Chat can be found in the session notice. During an answer portion of the presentation, the session moderator will post submitted questions on your behalf for as long as time permits and in the order in which they, are re they, were, they were received. In that window, please leave the following information. Your institutional name, the name of the individual posting the question, and finally your question. I would now like to introduce Dr. Kirill Tripkoff. Dr. Tripp is a full professor of pathology at the University of Calgary. He is a leading Canadian uropathologist and is a consultant for the Cal Calgary Laboratory Services, Southern Health Institute of Urology, and the Tom Baker Cancer Center in Calgary. Dr. Tripkoff has established the Anatomical Pathology Laboratory at Rocky View General Hospital in Calgary as one of the largest centralized uropathology centers in Canada and North America. He has over 110 peer-reviewed articles, numerous chapters, and other scholarly contributions. Dr. Tripkoff has conducted numerous courses, workshops, slide seminars in uropathology, and has given lectures on all continents. He's currently involved in, as a uropathology expert with several national and international expert panels, which have studied lines in uropathology and prostate cancer. Dr. Tripkoff has received several awards for his work. In 2013, he was awarded the Gravitz Medal for his outstanding contributions to the International Society of Urological Pathology. Without any further ado, I introduce Dr. Tripkoff to, to give today's talk on cancer. Kira, and the microphone over to you. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon to everybody in the East, and good morning to those in the West, because we are a big country. Um, my talk today will be on kidney, and I'll try to review the CAP protocol and the AJCC8 edition on renal cancer and distill it to provide clear messages what's important and why for a practicing pathologist. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And firstly, let's talk about the CAP accreditation requirements and the types of data elements. The protocol can be utilized for a variety of procedures and tumor types for clinical care purposes. But accreditation purposes, only the definitive primary cancer resection specimen is required to have so-called core elements and conditional data elements, which are reported in a synoptic format. So core data elements are those that are used to adequately describe appropriateness. For instance, essential data elements must be reported in all instances, even if the response is not applicable or cannot be determined. Additional data elements are those uh, that should be reported if they're applicable. For instance, you have a total number of lymph nodes examined in a specimen, but only if they are present in the specimen, they should be reported. And also, there is a th third type of elements that CAP recognizes. Those are optional data elements 
are identified with plus in the CAP protocol, and they may be considered for reporting as determined by local practice standards. So you may or may not include them in your data reports. The use of this protocol is not required for recurrent tumors or hepatic tumors that are resected at a different time than the primary tumor. The use protocol is also not required for uh, sections such as pathology reviews, which are performed at second institutions for seri consultation, second opinions, or review of outside case at a second institution. In the five to ten years, we have seen an extension of biopsy material in our practice. For instance, in Calgary, we see on an annual basis both heart needle core biopsies. And CAP recommends that all elements that are included in your report are optional elements. For instance, the procedure can be needle biopsy, incisional biopsy, or wedge biopsy. The laterality should be included right, left, or not specified histologic type. Of or cancer should be included as well as presence of sarcomatoid and rhabdoid features. The WHO I subgrade should be included as well as presence of necrosis or lymphovascular invasion if they are reported. However, because these are all optional data elements, I'll provide you with an example of how I sign uh, needle core biopsies. For uh, a sign out can read uh, like this left kidney, needle core biopsy, cell renal cell carcinoma, WHOI subgrade 204, and I usually add a comment based on the biopsy sample. Usually I also include comment on the non neoplastic kidney if it's included. And encourage people to use immunohistochemistry more frequently in these instances because needle core biopsies nowadays are not only um, used for definitive procedures, for instance, in our institutions, they're used for um, documentation of the tumor type prior to cryotherapy, but in some institutions, they may be used for just watchful waiting. And also, in some instances, needle core biopsies would allow differentiation between the primary renal neoplasm and a metastasis. Let's consider the following example. Needle core biopsy, which we recently saw in our practice, and as you can see, PAX-8, a typical marker that one would use, not specific, but very useful in the context of needle core biopsy of the kidney to indicate a renal origin of the neoplasm is completely negative. Well, the 3A marker that many of us had adopted in our practice as urothelial primary urothelial marker in GU is strong positive. So one may consider that this represents a poor differentiated urothelial carcinoma with the knowledge of the clinical history. However, although we not initially received this history, later on we learned that this patient had metast had primary <laughs> breast carcinoma and it was strongly positive for ER. So I, this is an example it is important to use at least a basic panel of immunohistochemistry in the routine evaluation of needle core biopsies. I've outlined here a simplified, rather simplified and not comprehensive uh, table that deals with the most common types that you may encounter in practice and a limited panel that you can consider using in your practice. For instance, uh, the most common uh, types uh, are included here, and all of the renal primaries will be positive for PAX-8. Cacanhydrase 9 is very useful when uh, positive because it indicates clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and typically it's negative in the other renal types. I must caution, however, that some less common renal plasms or carcinomas, such as clear cell tubulopapillary or renal cell carcinoma, with angiolyomyoma, like stroma, can also demonstrate uh, carbonic anhydrase 9 uh, activity. Uh, cytokeratin 7 is very useful when it's strongly positive in the context of the morphology and other immunohistochemical markers to support the diagnosis of papillary renal cell carcinoma or chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, but early it can be focally positive positive isolated cells. The negatives in this table are not absolute negatives. So immunohistochemistry should always be used in conjunction with biology. C10 is one of the markers that is often used in the assessment of renal primaries, and it is thought to represent a 
marker of proximal nephron differentiation. It is typically positive, usually in a membranous fashion in clear cell and papillary renal cell carcinoma, and negative in chromophobe and oncocytoma. Again, you might find occasional cases that may be positive for it. RAS is strongly positive in papillary renal cell carcinoma and a proportion of clear renal cell carcinoma. Uh, variable positivity can be seen, but it's often and usually negative in chromophobe renal cell carcinoma and oncocytoma. On the other hand, CD117 or KIT can be useful if it's uh, documented in a tumor, which may indicate uh, likelihood uh, that it represents uh, chromophobe renal cell carcinoma and oncocytoma and not clear cell and papillary. And Vimentin is typically positive in clear cell and papillary. Again, just want to emphasize that none of the negatives here are absolute negatives, so you may find variations and shouldn't be following this in a blind fashion. If you want additional information, ISAP has uh, provided this uh, paper on best practices in application of immunohistochemistry in kidney tumors in 2014, and my message to you again would be that immunohistochemistry should be used in conjunction with morphology for the kidney tumor diagnosis. In a tumor that doesn't really fit any of the recognized tumor types, you should resort to a descriptive sign-out, unclassified, unclassified, low-grade, unclassified, high-grade. Discussion on needle core biopsies. Let's look at the elements that are typically uh, reported in nephrectomies, radical or partial nephrectomies. In our practice, we see around 300 uh, partial radical nephrectomies, and the proportion of partial nephrectomies with nephron sparing surgery, which aims to preserve majority of the kidney, had increased significantly in, in uh, recent years. Uh, typically, it should include uh, the type of specimen, whether it represents only the kidney or whether a portion of the ureter or adrenal is included, laterality of the specimen, the types of the procedure as well as tumor site, which is an optional element you may include, whether it includes upper, either, or lower pole of the kidney, particularly in the gross description, as well as the tumor size. Uh, largest should be measured, or at least a largest two or five uh, tumors should be measured with the greatest dimension, and the additional dimensions, multiple sex should be performed, and the greatest dimension uh, should be measured. Tumor focality, whether it's unifocal and multifocal. I have a brief overview, and in the rest of my talk, I'll focus on some of the most important issues. So don't worry, we'll talk about these, and I'm sure some of you have questions regarding some of these. We will address those questions. In terms of the other elements, historic type of the renal neoplasm is included, as well as sarcomatoid or rhabdoid features, the grade, O4, WHO, ISAP grade. The tumor necrosis, any amount, we typically record either a focal presence of necrosis or extensive presence of necrosis. You should also include, if it's not identified, there is some literature that the percent of necrosis may correlate with the prognosis, so it's an optional element if you want to include the percent of necrotic tumor. And the extent of tumor, which pertains to the micros microscopic and macroscopic extent of the tumor, as well as presence of uh, positive margins in partial nephrectomy specimens or uh, margins in, for instance, positivity of the ureter. Um, Lymphovascular invasion is an optional element. If seen, should be reported. This pertains to the small vessel invasion within the, within the tumor. Real lymph nodes, how many have you examined? and how many are positive if you've identified them. And optional elements are the site, the size of metastasis, and the size of the largest node. T staging is a responsibility of the pathologist, and it also pertains to situations where you have multiple tumors, which should be designated with M, recurrent tumors with R, or post treatment, which should be designated as Y. And, uh, but you should include a comment on the non-neoplastic kidney pertaining to the regular uh, pathology, tubulointerstitial pathology, and vascular pathology, if these are present in the specimen, and other tumors or tumor-like lesions. However, to boil down in important sort of uh, categories, 
the listed ones on this side are the most important things that we should report and think uh, about when we report kidney specimens. They pertain to the pathologic stage, tumor grade, the morphologic type, the presence of sarcoid and rhabdoid differentiation, and the tumor necrosis. There is ample literature to support including these elements in uh, every report. And moreover, clinicians have uh, developed assessment models in which these pathological uh, features are key elements and hope that in the future, as we move into uh, uh, the precision medicine models, uh, still the pathologic parameters that we evaluate on a daily basis will be part of those models. Vascular invasion is somewhat less important and somewhat uh, controversial in terms of whether it's independently predictive. This pertains to microscopic of the vessels within the tumor. And uh, usually with large tumors, with large vein invasions, lymphovascular invasion may or may not be present, but if it's present, it should be documented in uh, the report. For the purpose of this talk, in a further sequence, I'll speak on uh, these prognostic parameters. They are slightly rearranged, and I'll cover the issues pertaining to the grades, sarcomatoid and rhabdoid differentiation, necrosis, morphologic type, and pathologic stage. So let's start with the WOI subgrade. Uh, most of uh, what we now uh, practice in kidney pathology uh, in contemporary fashion was established at the ISAP consensus meeting on adult renal tumors, which is a Canadian stamp because it was uh, during the ASCAP meeting in Vancouver in March 2012. And there is a series of articles which you can read that stem from this uh, nucleate or Furman grade that many of us have basically been trying to use is in existence since 1982. And you're all familiar with grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, and grade 4. However, uh, People recognize that there is great heterogeneity, and there are many questions that pertain to how um, uh, Furman was used in practice. For us, in this slide, you, you can see that there are areas where the grade is significantly different, grade 1 in the top portion of this uh, uh, picture and grade 4 in the bottom portion of these pictures. It was said to be uh, based on the worst area. However, uh, the grade was a combination of the nuclear size, the shape of the nuclei, and the nuclear size. And the size of the worst areas was not defined. It was somewhat selective. It's also not clear whether it should pertain only to the clear cell, uh, renal cell carcinoma, or should it apply to other types. And uh, in the last uh, decade or so, through of Brett Delahunt, primarily, who focused on the nucleolar size, grading in renal cell carcinoma has been essentially boiled down to a nucleolar grading system. In his publication, uh, Brett and his colleagues spoke on clear cell renal cell carcinoma, but also uh, it should be applied to papillary renal cell carcinoma, and the worst area was clearly defined as one high power field times uh, 40 or times 400. So now uh, we have a WHO I subgrading system, 1 to 4, which is what's similar to the uh, uh, first grading system. Uh, grade 1 are those cases where you can't see the nucleolar at high power magnification times 400. If you can see them at times 400, but not at times 100 or times 10 of ocular uh, magnification, they are two. If nuclei are visible at times 100, then you've got grade 3. Grade 4 also 
Previously, in the Fermat grade, encompasses extreme nuclear pleomorphism as well as multinuclear giant cells. Rhabdoid and sarcomatoid differentiation, in contrast to Fermat system, uh, have now been included under grade 4. And please note again that the is validated for clear cell renal cell carcinoma and papillary renal cell carcinoma. It should be applied to other renal types. And you may have read these papers and publications on uh, proposed grading system, for instance, for chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, but they've not uh, been validated and they are not recommended by the International Society of Logic Pathology. In situations when you're faced with a tumor that uh, you know what it represents, it's unclassified, you may include, and I often include uh, something like uh, equivalent to I sub WHO grade 2 or grade 3 to convey the message of uh, what uh, the grading is in that respective tumor. Different, the differentiation can be seen in any histologic type. Usually it can be sought diligently, it should be sought diligently on uh, growth examination, particularly in those areas that demonstrate a different uh, growth appearance, such as in this example of clear cells, a renal cell carcinoma, which is seen on the left, um, uh, uh, image with distinct yellow color and the infiltrative uh, white uh, uh, portion of the neoplasm, which typically grossly demonstrate also very firm appearance. Circulatory differentiation can be seen in any histologic type or it can be pure. In that instance, one can sign out the case as unclassified renal cell carcinoma exclusively with sarcomatoid differentiation. Invariably, uh, sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma is associated with a poor process, and there is uh, literature to indicate that the percent of sarcomatoid uh, renal cell carcinoma should be uh, re included in the report. The presence of rhabdoid or rhabdoid-like differentiation, there is literature published on both, is also currently considered as ISAP grade 4. This pertains to these uh, large cells with xenophilic abundant cytoplasm, eccentric nucleus with nucleolis. Often, present inclusions can be seen in these cases. In many instances, probably in about 20 to 30 percent of, of uh, uh, case with sarcomatoid the differentiation, also areas of rhabdoid morphology can be, can be seen. And there is a literature to support independently that the pressure of this differentiation, which can also be seen in any uh, uh, of the renal tumor types, is associated with worse prognosis, so it should be reported. Necrosis, both macroscopic and microscopic, should be recorded. It is important, uh, therefore, for the gross uh, uh, prosector or for the path assistant or pathologist or whoever is doing the grossing to first recognize this area and to document this area because if it's not recognized and sampled, it won't be um, possible to establish their presence on microscopic examination. This pertains to all the cases except uh, in those cases where pre-surgical embolization has been performed. And in those instances, the presence of necrosis simply reflects the procedure rather than the tumor nature. And as I mentioned previously, we typically report in our synoptic reports on a renal cell carcinoma presence of necrosis as focal loss extends. And there is uh, some data to uh, suggest that uh, percent of tumor necrosis should be recorded. And there are studies, for instance, uh, find the presence of necrosis less than 10%, up to 50% or more than 50% of the tumor. Again, uh, Tumor necrosis is an independent and important prognostic factor in clear cell uh, renal cell carcinoma and, chrom and chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, but it's not in papillary renal cell carcinoma because presence of papillary renal uh, presence of uh, uh, tumor necrosis in papillary renal cell carcinoma is a very frequent finding and it's not associated with uh, prognostic uh, significance. The case establishes grading, but there is evidence that it does work. Yes, there is, and there, uh, there is an excellent study that has been published in uh, a major 
surgical pathology that combines the ice upgrading and the tumor necrosis, and you can see very nice stratification of different traits. The stratification uh, of ice upgrading on its own without the presence of necrosis is slightly less powerful, and case can be potentially made for judging uh, grade one and grade two into category because they almost overlap. This is a list of the currently recognized uh, type of renal cell carcinoma, and I've highlighted uh, one in yellow, which is a new entity which has been added by the WHO in 2016 after the ISAP consensus meeting. The hydrogenase uh, uh, cell carcinoma was considered initially as emerging and provincial uh, provisional entity, uh, and two additional ones have been considered as provisional entities. These are very rare and not seen cases uh, of thyroid like follicular renal cell carcinoma or ALK location renal cell carcinoma in my practice, but uh, several times I've had close encounters with cases that I thought may represent thyroid-like follicular carcinoma. Uh, they were PAX8 positive. However, you should always keep in mind that thyroid mets can be seen in the kidney, and in those instances, you have thyroglobulin and TTF1 are very useful. Document that these may present metastatic cancers from the thyroid. Uh, the cases are too few. Usually, they look like thyroid uh, follicular carcinoma, but they're too few to uh, draw any definitive conclusions. The effectiveness of recognizing ALK translocation renal cell carcinoma stems from the fact that we do have uh, some available therapies, such as ALK uh, inhibitors, to uh, treat these cancers. But again, uh, the morphology can vary in those few cases that have been described in the literature as well as their behavior. Obviously, for the purpose of this presentation, I cannot focus on all renal tumor types, but I'd like to uh, draw your attention on some of the entities that are new or some concepts of renal neoplasia that are relatively new and that you should be aware of. I'd like to start by focusing first on succinate dehydrogenase deficient renal cell carcinoma. But you ask yourself, and I often get asked, why should we bother about these rare tumors? Well, they bend patients directly. We, in the kind of very well-defined entities, we may understand the disease processes of cancer better, and as well, they allow for rash transfer, and new techniques can be tested and applied in these tumors. For instance, is the efficient renal cell carcinoma is a cancer that you should think of when you're looking at a case that potentially look to you like oncocytoma, it has a solid growth, it doesn't have a capsule, full cysts can be seen, and at higher magnification you see clear grades, relatively uniform, with uh, cells within this cytoplasm. Uh, in serious, they may resemble uh, oncocytoma in some areas, they may demonstrate more extensive evacuation of the cytoplasm, such as illustrated in the example to the left, and uh, uh, embedded norenal tumors may be seen within the tumor. However, if you see areas such as this, you just uh, maybe think about this entity more carefully because the quality of the uh, cytoplasm is more sort of flocculent, wispy, it's not homogeneous and finely granular as you see it in oocytoma. You should diligently sought, uh, seek um, vessels in these instances and uh, some evidence that they represent giant mitochondria. But it will be invariably uh, positive in all of these cases, but the key stain that you should uh, use to uh, conf cases is SDHP. The hydrogenase is an enzyme is present in the mitochondria of all the cells. It's composed of four different units, A, B, C, and D. However, if one of these units is unstable, the whole complex is unstable, there is lack of staining for SDHB. 
SDHB uh, nativity can be used as in histochemical markers to demonstrate age deficiency that affects the components A, B, C, or D. Most of the renal cell carcinoma, the affected component is SDHB. In evaluating this uh, uh, sites with SDHB, it's a little bit of a tricky stain. You should recognize a positive internal control, often with scattered mast cells or endothelial cells or inflammatory cells, the normal renal parenchyma should also be positive, but uh, be careful when you're examining just with VHL mutations or clear cytoplasm because they may be spuriously negative with SDHB in our practice and we find it very useful. These cases are rare, but uh, uh, this is a definitive diagnostic test to confirm these cases, and SDHB immunohistochemistry represents an effective screening for SDH mutation. When you're considering whether you're dealing with SDH-deficient renal cell carcinoma or oncocytoma, uh, you should consider that pan-keratin will be negative in many of these cases, while in oncocytoma it will be positive. CKIT will also be negative in oncocytoma positive. pax will be positive in both, but SDHB will be negative only in SDH-deficient renal cell carcinoma and two large publications with large number of cases that have been published in 2014, which helped establish this entity. SDH-deficient neoplasia is not only restricted to no neoplasms, but also can be seen in chromocytoma and paraganglioma syndrome type 4, uh, in which uh, paragangliomas uh, can be uh, present or SDH-deficient. GISTs can be present, or pituitary adenomas even can be present. But the definitive test to recognizing these is deficient uh, neoplasms is SDH uh, negative uh, immunohistochemistry by mutated mitochondrial complex. Uh, I'm uh, illustrating, for example, a case of SDH deficient GIST, which is typically located in the stomach is typically multinodular, multifocal, and composed of more epithelial cells. It tends to metastasize, but behaves indolently. Uh, the, the SDH deficient GIST is probably a very small percentage of all the GIST, but all of these elements that I mentioned would make you think of something like this, probably less than 5%. And if you want to read more about the spectrum of SDH-deficient neoplasia, I will point a recent very nice and comprehensive review by Anthony Gill in histology. What have we learned about SDH-deficient renal cell carcinoma? Well, they're typically in younger adults, so if you have a younger adult, you suspect uh, SDH-deficient uh, renal cell carcinoma. Oncocytoma-like features, as I've illustrated, with solid or nested growth, and presence of flocculent plasm, grade nucleoli, nuclei, intracytoplasmic vacuoles, and focal cysts. Ancient C kit, pancytokeratin, cytokeratin 7 are typically negative in these cases, and vimentin is mostly negative. Each negativity on immunohistochemistry is diagnostic, which signifies a dysfunction of the mitochondrial complex 2 uh, with SDH germline mutation. So, the majority of these cases demonstrate indolent behavior. About one-third of them are aggressive, and in those instances, the morphology is slightly different from what I illustrated. It demonstrates high-grade nuclei, prominent nucleoli. In some cases, you may find transition uh, between the typical stereotypical morphology and this more aggressive morphology. If you read uh, about SDH-deficient Cancer brief summaries included already in the WHO classification, and as well, uh, whole slide digital microscopy is available on uh, the cases we have studied, uh, which kindly put together by Anthony Hill. The that I'd like to draw your attention to is hereditary leiomyomatosis associated renal cell carcinoma. As pathologists, we are often not aware of the clinical presentation of the patient. For example, here you've got a uh, patient with um, 
hematosis associated renal cell carcinoma with multiple pyelomyomas in skin. And what we have learned about this uh, it largely pertains to this publication from the NIH by Maria Merino, which emphasized the presence of eunophilic prominent viral-like inclusions in uh, renal neoplasms identified in these patients. However, in that publication, they also talked about actual patterns that may be tubular, papillary, tubular, solid, or mixed. So, uh, for many years, people were a little bit confused from a practical standpoint when uh, and how to approach this entity. Hereditary myomatosis renal cell carcinoma is a autosomal dominant situation, uh, condition, and cutaneous and uterine lyomyomas are very frequently found in about 70% of affected individuals. And for instance, women with these lyomyomas undergo hysterectomy at a young age, usually below the age of 35. Uh, for renal neoplasms, it was said that they resemble papillary 2 renal cell carcinoma or collecting duct like renal cell carcinoma. And the key uh, molecular abnormality in these cases is the germline mutation in fumarate hydratase, which, uh, if absent, allows fumarate to accumulate, which is a tumor suppressor the gene lead to abnormal succination of substrates such as succinocysteine, and this substrate can be identified by immunohistochemistry. What do we need to know about these cases, you may ask yourself, because they're very aggressive. They are probably one aggressive renal tumors, and about 50% of the patients presenting with these tumors do demonstrate mm -hmm. metastasis, and virtually everybody dies uh, within five years. You do at this point about the ACEs, and there are many uh, attempts to come up with a treatment strategy. It is also important because of uh, the genetic implications for the members of their families if they're mutated because they are then put on a lifelong surveillance for these neoplasms. Just to illustrate uh, uh, Krebs cycle, uh, citric acid cycle, and the two uh, enzymes that we talked about in the first example of uh, succinate dehydrogenase deficient, which oxidizes succinate to fumarate, and fumarate hydratase, which catabolizes uh, uh, the transition of fumarate to malate. There are two steps of the Krebs cycle, and accumulation of fumarate and, and, and uh, 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 succinate dehydrogenase are considered tumor metabolic tumor repressors look like. They typically look like papillary renal cell carcinoma in many instances, but not exclusively. But histochemistry, uh, you can see that they lack uh, expression of fumarate hydratase in the neoplastic cells. And the abnormal uh, two SEs are always expressed in these uh, fumarate hydratase deficient tumors, whereas in tumors that are not fumarate hydratase deficient, that is retained and to see is not expressed. The sort of simple or simplified approach to these tumors or to think of these tumors is when you're having a papillary tumor with, with a bit of unusual morphology, you may often see stick or tubicystic morphology with highly nice rather than presence of foamy macrophages collecting duct-like areas, solid areas, cribriforming areas, areas that look like intracystic papillary proliferations or tubular areas with vacuolation. So in presence of different patterns, in addition to papillary, should prompt you to include this deficient carcinoma in your differential diagnosis. In many of these cases, uh, based on the most recent literature, uh, have been mislabeled as either unclassified high-grade type 2 renal cell carcinoma, tubulocystic carcinoma with de-differentiated foci, or even collecting duct carcinoma. And as you can recognize, many of these uh, demonstrate adverse uh, uh, findings. In of our recent publications, 
we were able to identify 19% of those unclassified high-grade renal cell carcinoma to be associated with, with H deficiency. And only in about a third of these, we could retrospectively elicit a, an information about association with hereditary leiomyoma renal cell carcinoma syndrome. When you're thinking about uh, fumarate hydratase deficient renal cell carcinoma and HLRCC, I'd like you to think about uh, uh, a histomolecular entity because the pathologist very often is not aware of the clinical presentation of the patients, whether the patient had anything on their skin, including leiomyomas, or any past history in female patients about leiomyomas. None of this is usually available to us, so we cannot. Uh, classify or label these cases initially as hereditary leiomyoma renal cell carcinoma. That's why we use this FH deficient uh, cell carcinoma as a descriptive uh, uh, term to define uh, these uh, tumors. This is a new concept, and I'd like to summarize uh, the presence of negative fumarectase on IH. She strongly correlates with FH gene alterations and morphology compatible with HLRCC, but often without evidence of the stigmata of the syndrome, and the negative FH immunohistochemistry should prompt screening for additional genetic testing uh, in the patient and members of their family. And I just want to mention that FH is commercially available. You can use it. We use it in our practice. It is more specific and equally sensitive compared with 2SC, 2-succinostain, which is currently not commercially available. It's only available uh, for research uh, purposes. So at least FH is available and uh, these uh, cases can be tested. The example of a neoplasm that I'd like to draw to your attention is uh, this type of neoplasm, which often looks like solid and cystic renal mass. And on, uh, Morphy demonstrates eosinophilic, solid, and cystic morphology with often presence hobnailing within cysts. The, the septa of the cysts have variable lining, and they demonstrate either diffuse eosinophilic growth or higher magnification invariably and very easily you will pick up a coarse galerity or stippling in the cytoplasm. This uh, cytoplasmic stippling is a very culture and most useful morphologic feature to identify this entity. This is another renal entity, uh, which is currently uh, termed eosinophilic solid and cystic renal cell carcinoma. In our publication, in a recent publication, we have studied 16 uh, of these. They were present. Uh, in uh, uh, sporadic patients, but a small proportion of them can be seen in tuber sclerosis patients. Uh, they are great majority found in females, and they demonstrate indolent clinical course. On immunohistochemistry, they are Paxate positive, racemase jelly positive, cytokeratin-7, and CKIT are negative. The most useful, although not always present, feature is the presence of cytokeratin-20 positivity in about 80% of these cases, uh, and negativity for cytokeratin-20 is not um, an illusion criteria, but it, when present in the context of this morphology may be very helpful. And we have done further work in terms of characterizing this new and emerging entity on a molecular level, which demonstrates uh, a repetitive molecular changes in terms of uh, uh, copy number gains on chromosome 7 and 16, as well as loss of uh, uh, number losses on uh, chromosome X and 22. In summary, this is a novel tumor with most indolent behavior. You can recognize it because it has a very characteristic morphology with cytokeratin, frequent cytokeratin-20 positivity, and there are ongoing work on molecular and, uh, and more specific molecular changes in this entity, and I hope we'll see some of these uh, soon. Uh, 
great majority of these cases are seen in females with sporadic tumors, and these are mostly solitary. Patients were described post-neuroblastoma, and if you recall, post-neuroblastoma existed as a distinct entity, uh, renal cell carcinoma, in the previous WHO, but now has been removed because most of these represent translocation-type carcinomas or represent examples of this entity. I just want to add that more recently we have identified two patients out of about 60 that we are aware of with this type of tumor that demonstrated metastatic behavior. So great majority of them are benign. The last portion of my talk, I just want to uh, focus on the issues of pathologic stage, which is one of the key uh, prognostic parameters in renal cell carcinoma. This stems from, again, the work of the ISAP consensus meeting, and most of the things that I'm going to talk about you can find in this publication or in a subsequent publication, which provides sort of a more you know, personalized and practical uh, guide uh, as to how the sampling and stage evaluation in renal cell carcinoma should be done. And uh, WHO and AJCC uh, mutually essentially uh, have embraced uh, these strategies in terms of and, and uh, criteria in terms of the assessment of uh, the stage. The most important issues when evaluating a renal tumor is to determine whether the uh, tumor is confined within the kidney or whether it extends outside of the kidney into the major veins, perinephric tissues, adrenal gland, but not beyond garota fascia, which is a fascia uh, aligning the outer uh, fat compartment around the kidney. The P stage in the latest edition of AJC has been defined as tumor extending into the renal vein or the segmental branches or invading the pelvic ICL system or invading the perirenal and renal sinus fat, but not beyond Garota's fascia. And changes uh, in uh, the wording of the stage has been have been highlighted and underlined. So, uh, the study of changes uh, of the AJCC TNM8 edition primarily pertain to the definition of the primary tumor, PT3 disease, though grossly was eliminated from the description of the renal vein. So you may have a microscopic incision of the vein that you can identify, and that still uh, represents PT3. Uh, the muscle-containing uh, descriptor of the vein has also been omitted because you don't need muscle to uh, demonstrate uh, that you are dealing with a vein, the extent of muscle, the presence of muscle is also not important in terms of determining whether a vein is segmental or not. So for those reasons, the muscle containing have been omitted as descriptors for segmental veins. And on the other hand, invasion into of the pelvic alicial system was added in the uh, latest edition. The tumor stage has been with us for a long time, uh, um, at least uh, since 1968, as key prognostic parameter, and it's used in prognostic nomograms. And now we have the eighth edition of um, JCC. Hand of renal tumors helps the pathologist to carry the burden and give him some guidelines to accomplish the goals of thorough gross examination, adequate sampling, and reporting of stage and other important parameters. When a specimen is received in the lab, uh, the first goal is to identify and sample the adrenal vein, uh, the adrenal gland, which is uh, located in the superior and inner aspect, typically within the perinephric fat, uh, the vascular margins, and the ureter. And you, uh, this is how we do it in our, uh, in our lab. We identify the length of the ureter, it should be measured and reported, and as well, uh, it should be uh, sectioned at the resection margin. And I've always wondered as to why do we need to uh, sample uh, the resection margin because we find, quote, unquote, nothing. Well, you may find in situ carcinoma, incidentally, or as in this example, you may find an extensive vascular invasion, which was present at the vascular margin in this uh, renal cancer that demonstrated extensive retrograde vein invasion. The of the specimen is typically done along the long axis. 
And in our lab, we typically insert probes within the renal veins, and we use those probes as um, um, guidelines or um, guiding a plane um, uh, uh, sections to expose uh, the, the inner uh, composition of the renal tumor. So you may put them in the collecting system or larger veins, recognizing that veins typically lie in a uh, plane that is anterior to the collecting system. So here is an initial section of a specimen along the long axis. We do it from the lateral, from the medial, doesn't really matter. On the right-hand side, you have an example of a tumor which has been opened through the collecting system. And the first section of the tumor may not be the perfect one to, ex to expose the whole uh, kidney, but may need additional parallel sections a, to examine uh, the relationship of tumor with the adjacent organs, and B, to potentially uh, assess uh, the uh, vein invasion uh, of the tumor. Whether it's ink or not, it's a matter of preference. There is no strong um, census meeting against, uh, from, by the ISAP members whether you use complete or localized uh, uh, inking on gross nephrectomy specimens. In our lab, we do do localized inking. When you have partial nephrectomy specimens, when you don't have perinephric fat, probably the most important uh, inking pertains to the section margin of the renal parenchyma. The tumor measurement uh, is important because the size of the tumor pertains to the stage that you ultimately end up assigning to the case. and. Uh, with a tumor that uh, protrudes into adjacent parenchyma uh, uh, that does not necessarily uh, mean that it infiltrates there, but in a event, you should measure any tumor invading into extracapsular tissue of the greatest dimension. Another dilemma that has been posed in 2012 uh, among the uh, specialists, geopathology specialists, is whether to measure tumor uh, with the tumor or whether to include measurement of the tumor extending into the renal vein. And uh, the consensus at that time was to confine the measurements of the kidney to, of the tumor to the one that is uh, uh, confined within the kidney and not to measure the tumor invading into the renal or the caval vein. Stage T1 and stage T2 pertain to the tumor limit to the kidney. Uh, and uh, um, milestones are 4 centimeters and 7 centimeters, but I always caution prosectors to uh, demonstrate extra vigilance when dealing with uh, tumors that are uh, exceeding 7 centimeters, and if they don't document uh, extension into perirenal fat or renal sinus fat, they should usually go back and take extra careful uh, um, evaluation and, and adrenal sections of these ears so that not to unstage the kidney. There's also a possibility that you may have a tumor that is um, more than 7 centimeters or even more than uh, uh, 10 centimeters, and this tumor is still organ confined. But again, careful sampling should be all uh, large tumors not to downstage them. In terms of the TNM descriptors, you may have multiple tumors in a single site that's designated with M, Y, during or following initial multimodal therapy, not uh, uh, before the therapy, uh, or a recurrent tumor after a disease survival after a certain period of time when tumor potentially recurs, and A, there is a stage, this is a stage determined at autopsy. R descriptor pertains to the residual tumor after curative therapy, and it can be uh, zero if no residual tumor is present, microscopic or macroscopic, one or two, or it cannot be accessed, and the designation is X. A question often arises how many blocks should be submitted for e examination of the tumor, and the direct answer is usually depends because, you know, you can sample as many uh, as you need to uh, to assess the tumor relationship with the renal capsule, with the renal sinus, with the adrenal gland, and the renal pelvis. But definitely all the areas 
look different, have different appearance or consistency should be sampled so that areas of sarcomatoid differentiation are not necrosis are not missed. Here's a pragmatic guideline, a one block per centimeter uh, should, be, uh, should be used. And in this kind of uh, example of a small tumor, uh, can, uh, can be sampled a tumor with only three blocks. In terms of multiple renal tumors, you may find them in two situations, in a hereditary scenario, and I've listed several situations, or in general, you can find them as sporadic tumors, not frequently, but in about 5% of cases. And in those instances, papillary renal cell carcinoma would be more frequent than cell cell, and they would be more commonly bilateral. The index and the satellite tumor are mostly identical, but in up to about a quarter of the cases, uh, you may have uh, a discordant scenario where, for instance, one is the primary index tumor is clear cell, the, the, the smaller or small one or multiple tumors are papillary. And if transparent surgery uh, is performed, uh, multifocal tumors tend to recur, but if radical nephrectomy is performed, then uh, the prognosis is similar to unifocal tumors. How would the multiple tumors be measured? Well, you should measure and report tumor dimensions for all tumors up to a maximum of about five. And as well, you should sample and stage minimum the largest tumors if the smaller looks similar. But if you're uncertain about the histologic type or adverse findings in the remaining tumors, you should do additional sampling from them. And if you uh, then stage the tumor, the largest T should be used but uh, as I mentioned previously, multifocal tumors should be labeled with M. If you have different type, subtypes in different tumors, the HPT3A uh, pertains to tumor rating into the renal veins, segmental branches, regardless of the muscle composition or pelvic CL system, or original fat and renal sinus fat. So, Assessment of perirenal fat is sometimes obvious on uh, P3 uh, on gross examination, such as in the example present to the right. But you shouldn't assume if you have a nobi protrusion with smooth contours of the tumor into the perirenal fat that this represents uh, a nephric invasion. Pushing border, even uh, if it's beyond the normal kidney, is not diagnostic of invasion. Uh, but invasion is at least uh, can be established grossly if the lost if if there is loss of the smooth interface or irregular nodules are protruding into the fat. In cases where you have a protruding tumor in the perirenal fat, you should uh, perform multiple perpendicular sections of tumor fat uh, interface to establish whether there is indeed invasion or not. And microscopy. Uh, a definitive evidence of perinatic fat invasion is when you're seeing situations when the tumor directly touches the fat or extends as irregular tongues with or without desmoplastic uh, reaction into the fat. Then you will find problematic perinatic fat uh, invasion scenarios, and a couple of those are illustrated here. Usually in these instances, um, uh, judgment should be used in both of these examples, I would probably interpret them as perinephric fat invasion. In the uh, example to the left, the tumor touches the fat. It sort of breaches the pseudocapsule at the periphery, which you typically see at the periphery of renal cell carcinoma. In the second example, it interferes and infiltrates within the fat. Sinus is the central perinephric fat component. Compartment, and please note that there is no fibrous capsule between the inner portion of the kidney and the central perinephric fat compartment. Uh, this uh, space uh, resides between the pain system and the renal parenchyma and represents the main lymphovascular supply of the kidney. Renal invasion has been and is considered probably the most important a route through which tumors uh, aid within the kidney, uh, particularly for clear cell renal cell carcinoma, but also for other types. In one of the studies performed by Steve Bonsip, it was shown that more than 90% of clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which were beyond 7 centimeters, invaded the renal sinus. 
into the sinus has even, according to some more recent studies, worse prognosis than invasion into the perinephric fat. We have a situation of the, uh, when you have to evaluate the renal sinus, essentially you have two general uh, uh, scenarios. The scenario is when the invasion uh, in the sinus is very clear or the absent, for instance, if you have a small and uh, peripheral tumor, in that scenario you may take only one block to confirm the presence or absence of a lesion. However, if you are uncertain if the sinus invasion is present, you should uh, sample at least, uh, restricted to three blocks, but at least three blocks from the tumor sinus interface. What uh, uh, is what you would use as criterion of renal sinus invasion on microscopy. This situation pertains to the direct contact of the tumor with the fat within the sinus area. The second represents the uh, presence of tumor within the loose connective tissue beyond the renal parenchyma into the renal sinus. And the third uh, scenario pertains to the presence of tumor within endothelial line space within the sinus regardless of the size. What renal vein invasion? Well, renal vein invasion can find as tumor grossly extending into the renal vein on the, or the branches, and I've mentioned previously that the word grossly has been taken out in the last edition of AJCC. Renal vein invasion represents tumor attached to the vessel wall or tumor that fills and extends the vessel lumen. Whenever you are considering vein invasion into the renal sinus, always pay attention to these small nodular uh, satellite protrusions in the vicinity of tumors and sample them carefully because invariably you will find that they demonstrate vascular invasion in the renal sinus. Perinephric fat zone without the presence of tumor within the fat should also be considered PT3A uh, stage uh, renal uh, to the perinephric tissue. What about renal vein and margin sampling? Very often you have a, uh, a retraction of the vein after fixation and the margin may look seriously negative. In those scenarios you should submit the actual margin plus additional sections of the tumor thrombus if you're expecting that uh, the tumor is adherent to the renal uh, wall. In terms of the margin positivity, essentially you should rely on microscopy and renal margin should be considered positive only if tumor is adherent at the actual margin, which is confirmed microscopically. Uh, mm -hmm. Into the pelvic LCL system has also been added, but very rarely you would see perical, uh, pel invasion into the pelvic LCL system without renal sinus invasion. In a cave invasion can uh, be uh, represented by tumor uh, extending below the vena cava or above, or above the diaphragm, but also PT3C represents invasion into the wall of the vena cava. Uh, here's an example of the tumor that has overgrown not only uh, vena cava above the diaphragm, but extends into uh, the atrium of the heart from an autopsy specimen in our institution. And also another situation of PT3C is when the wall is invaded by the tumor. And this pertains uh, to a specific scenario when you uh, deal with specimens that are submitted as caval thrombus. And your uh, role in those situations is twofold. First, to indeed um, that there is a presence of tumor in that specimen, and secondly, to potentially identify the wall of the vena cava and if there is invasion or not. So here is an example of tumor invading the wall of the uh, vena cava, and in those scenarios, you should include at least more sense to search for either caval wall tissue and possible invasion. Well, gland involvement can be either contiguous or as metastasis, as illustrated in this example, and it has prognostic significance. Uh, direct renal involvement uh, is uh, considered PT4 disease, 
extra uh, renal disease and it is associated with significantly worse prognosis than perinephric vein invasion, probably renal sinus invasion. And it matches PT4 tumors invasion into another organ. Metastatic adrenal gland involvement, an unusual scenario is illustrated here. It has also even worse prognosis. In the assessment of the hilar lymph nodes, you should restrict the evaluation to palpation and dissection of hilar fat only, but uh, don't be frustrated because you will not find them very frequently because nodes are found in less than 10% of cases. And uh, they, if they are grossly visible, they will be positive in about 80% of cases. But if you extend uh, your effort and spend time identifying microscopic nodes, you will find them invariably but it will be a futile exercise because they will be all benign. And uh, searching for occult nodes, nodes, which is based on this publication of more than 800 cases from the University of Chicago. Adrenal lymph nodes uh, can be single or, or multiple, but typically this procedure is associated with high morbidity and is not routinely uh, performed. Uh, when you see them, you should examine all submitted tissue separately, and these are the possible veins, uh, lymph nodes that are sought by and evaluated during the surgery by the surgeons. And if they suspect, they would or may su uh, submit uh, suspected nodes. The involved renal parenchyma, the normal renal parenchyma, should also be evaluated, uh, and we typically evaluate it adjacent to to the tumor as well as distant to the tumor because in many instances you may find presence of pathology that is not related to the tumor. A routine assessment should be, and a statement about the routine assessment should be included in all the reports for possible concurrent glomerular, tubular, interstitial, and vascular kidney disease. And in cases that you suspect, you may use either PA or Jones metanamine silver, or you may consult with your nephropathology colleagues. Invariably, in about up to a third of the cases, you will find uh, diabetic changes that are unsuspected or you may not be aware of, or you may find chronic atherosclerotic or hypertensive vascular disease. And recently, there are some studies that have been published in terms of how much renal parenchyma you need to include such a statement, and it seems that there's at least 5 millimeters parenchyma to make that statement. If the TNM uh, stage system, the value has been shown in previous uh, 7th edition. This is an example of a large multi-institutional Italian study of more than 5,000 cases, and you can see nice stratification of the stages, slightly lapping in situations where you have PT2B and PT3C, probably because a small number of cases were included in these categories. So it is expected that AJCC 8th edition staging for renal cancer perform at least as well as the 7th edition. So what are my final uh, take messages for you? Uh, you should utilize the new WHO ISAP grading system, and you should educate clinicians in your institutions. You should modify them if you're still, still using the uh, grading system. You should recognize the pending spectrum and emerging uh, spectrum of the novel renal neoplasms, and please don't call anything that doesn't fit into a recognized category as something that doesn't belong into a category. Just label unclassified renal cell carcinoma, high grade or low grade, etc. HCC and CAP, uh, um, in their latest iteration, introduced some minor staging changes and refined some definitions, but they actually retain most of the seventh edition parameters. And the stage still remains the key to prognostication of renal cancer patient, and you really don't need a microscope. But you need a pathologist with uh, use of the most basic tools which are illustrated here. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to address any questions in case you feel like this. Thank you, Chokov, for your presentation. We have a few questions. If you have a question, you can turn to the chat bar on the right, and I will read it out loud. 
The first question is from Galnar Rusty from Markville Stouffville Hospital. Do you include Furman, Furman's grade in addition to the WHO slash ISIP grade? And are two grading systems compatible? As you saw from my presentation, they're uh, identical. They differ in certain instances. We currently do not include Furman uh, in our reporting because Furman is replaced. 2012 by the first ISAP nuclear grading system. Now this system is called WHO ISAP grading system. And if you read the list, um, 2016 edition of the WHO, you will see that this one is recommended. Certainly there are overlaps, particularly uh, regarding one, two, and three, but the deficiency uh, of uh, 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 new uh, system are better uh, than the initial one, and the, as well the stage four includes also presence of sarcomatoid and rhabdoid or rhabdoid-like morphology, which has not been previously introduced. Remember, when uh, the paper was published in 1982, only about 80 or 90 cases were included in that study, and various tumor types were also included. The size of the area was also not defined, and a number of different variables were incorporated. So our practice shows that uh, the new system is much easier to use, is easy to understand, although it is analogous, it is not completely identified, uh, identical to the Furman system. So I would encourage you to uh, switch or to change or to transfer to the new system and educate clinicians in institution. Uh, second question is from Dr. Mona Bashara from Grand River Hospital slash Kitchener. Do you require a tumor directly touching fat without any intervening fibrous tissue to diagnose invasion into perinephric fat tissue? On an example, in every instance where you have tumor touching the fat without the presence of uh, pseudocapsule at the periphery, um, I would lean toward interpreting that as uh, tumor invasion into the perirenal tissue. Obviously, if you're not sure, you may make um, uh, session deeper levels, or you may include, um, if you're not sure, you should essentially say suspicious but not definitive for um, uh, perinephric fat invasion if you're not 100% sure about the interpretation of a uh, certain area, and that's the only a section that you're basing your staging uh, on. Thank you. The next question is from Jessica Oginski. So you mean visible at 400x, but not 100x? 40, it's times 40 magnification. If you can see them at uh, times 40 magnification, but you can't see them in times 10 magnification on your ocular um, uh, when you're looking that down the mi uh, microscope, that's the distinction. At higher magnification, you will see the nucleoli, but at lower magnification, you may not be able to see the nucleoli. Essentially, um, WISEP1 uh, represents a tumor where you don't see any nucleoli, then you, the nuclei look typically like lymphocytes. Times two, they have slightly more open chromatin pattern, but you may you will not be able to see the nucleoli in an area that encompasses times 40 magnification uh, at at um, uh, lower magnification at times 10. Uh, so the difference is whether they are visible at times 10 or times 40. If they're uh, invariably showing visibility in majority of the nuclei at 10 magnification on your microscope, then you should call them ISAP grade 3, if they're not ISAP grade 2. Okay, follow-up question from Jessica. So 200X does not count anymore? A few pathologists uh, use 200X, and I, I don't really have it, <laughs> times 20 or 200 um, uh, magnification on, on my microscope. Most standard microscopes do have uh, times 10, times 40, times 60 or 100, but times 20 is not factored in this simply because the rarity of uh, of the use in practice. 
Um, there's also a follow-up question to what we previously asked about the tumor directly touching fat. So uh, Mona has clarified, if you, fib if you see fibrous um, pseudocapsules surrounding the tumor in perinephric fat, do you still call it invasion into the perinephric fat? No. Uh, if uh, there is a desmoplastic irregular reaction and you clearly see that the tumor extends beyond the pseudocapsule, then you should consider perinephric fat invasion. But the presence of pseudocapsule is a very frequent phenomenon that you may see invariably almost in every single clear cell renal cell carcinoma or papillary renal cell carcinoma chromophobe because it is simply a function of the kidney growing and eliciting the action from the adjacent tissue at the periphery of the kidney. So um, uh, perinephric fat invasion uh, represent situations when you see tumor directly touching the fat or infiltrating the fat, or you see an irregular outline with some desmoplastic reaction with the tumor protruding into the fat. But the presence of pseudocapsule by itself does not mean that the tumor is infiltrating into the fat. The next question uh, is from L. Wang, PGY4 at McGill University. Would you reference for algorithm to further investigate for novel renal tumor entities, especially when histology or morphology is not always uniform. We will expand the IHC panel for SDH, FH, RCC, or the mutation panel for MIT. I addressed uh, some of this question in my presentation, and I, I've made my presentation and PDF of my presentation available. Essentially, you know, um, um, I don't use routinely in every single case immunohistochemistry uh, in terms of the evaluation because it's not necessary. I stated clearly that I would encourage uh, use of immunohistochemistry panel, at least basic, when you have limited tissue such as needle core biases. But in cases when, you, when you're dealing with a tumor that really neither by morphology nor by immunohistochemistry panel clearly fits into any of the recognized categories, you have two options, either to uh, consult with someone um, who is considered a specialist within your institution or outside of, in, or of your institution, and um, to perform uh, potentially additional um, fish studies or, or um, molecular studies to evaluate the entity, but there's no specific algorithm. I mean, the tumors come in three flavors. One, some are clear cells, some are um, um, eosinophilic or pink, and some are blue. So you have a very broad differential diagnosis, and you should know the lay of the land. Um, uh, the whole picture is that great majority of renal tumors fall into the well-recognized categories that I've outlined, clear cell papillary chromophobe and oncocytoma. But anything that uh, does not clearly fit into this or in the other renal categories uh, that are currently recognized, I would uh, um, uh, consider doing either additional investigation or consulting with, with a specialist in geopathology. question from HDQ is, how do you distinguish conspicuous from non-conspicuous nucleoli? That question, and that's a matter of semantics. Again, if you can see them, uh, let's use the analogy of the previously asked question. If you can see them at low power magnification at times 10, then they're conspicuous and they're probably enlarged. Now, I would, uh, I would uh, use them. But, you know, the semantics of the word conspicuous has varied and is variable in terms of uh, uh, the uh, discussion of uh, many different types. In the setting of FH-deficient renal cell carcinoma, they're not only conspicuous, they're markedly enlarged. They're typically uh, described as viral-like inclusions. So in those situations where you have this excessively conspicuous you should consider, at least in your differential diagnosis, the possibility of FH-deficient cancer. Not their specific, but at least you should pursue that line of investigation um, because consequences of missing such a case may not only be serious for the patient, but also for some of the family members. 
Thank you. The next question is from Blue Water Health Sarnia. Please discuss renal sinus surgical margin. That's a good question. Uh, renal sinus surgical margin, I, I don't think that uh, beyond evaluation of the vein and ureteral margin, you should embark on specific evaluation of the surgical margin of the, of the tumor. And I'm not aware of uh, any literature that has specifically addressed the issue of the surgical uh, margin of the renal sinus assessment and, and its uh, um, significance or prognostic relevance. Thank you. Another question from HDQ. Do you recommend sampling the entire tumor interface in partial nephrectomies? The uh, uh, institution, we typically generously sample um, partial nephrectomy tumors, and typically partial nephrectomy initially, you know, it was um, used uh, for smaller tumors up to three, four um, centimeters. More recently, it is uh, used even for larger tumors, particularly if they're very located, if they can be technically uh, easily uh, detected without compromising the rest of the, the kidney. So in those instances, uh, if it's a smaller tumor, I would definitely put the whole uh, tissue through. We definitely put whole um, uh, tumor through with the resection margin in smaller partial nephrectomy specimens. But even for larger tumors, I would I would sort of suggest a more just sampling if there are any sort of issues that pertain to uh, the status of the margins of the probability of um, perinephric fat invasion, etc. The next question is from Jessica Oginski. Do you still use Hale's colloidal iron for chromophore versus oncotoma? Is C7 only good enough? On needle core biopsies, I do use uh, a modification of colloidal iron, which is called Muller-Maury colloidal iron, and I do try to make a diagnosis of, for instance, oncocytoma or chromophobe on needle core biopsy. Uh, on needle core biopsy, if I can make that distinction, provided the morphology, immunohistochemistry, and special stains such as Muller-Maury colloidal iron is is positive. Muller-Maury colloidal iron is uh, uh, typically uh, negative in, in oncocytoma, you can always use uh, the glomerular basement membrane in normal glomeruli, which is blue. It's typically blue. In, in um, chromophobe, it's negative or it's pink in, in oncocytoma, and I do use it particularly in needle core biopsy. Not that it's essential, uh, but I find it more useful. I don't think that hecoloidal iron, at least in my practice, has proven useful, and it's one of those that have given a lot of frustrations to pathologists. I understand that. Uh, but um, uh, you may uh, try sort of this modification of colloidal iron, which I think it's somewhat more useful in this uh, specific scenario when evaluating um, uh, the di differential between oncocytoma and chromophobe. At least it does add one layer of, of certainty in, in establishing in the diagnosis. It may or may not be helpful. It's sometimes helpful in my practice. Um, thank you. That was the last question that's currently in the chat. We have a few minutes. If you'd like to add in your question, please type it in now. In the meantime, I will remind you that this session has been recorded and will be available on cancerview.ca, sharing the link with you. mentioned previously, um, I would be happy to share um, the piece of my presentation with everybody who had attended this session. Um, for fair use in your institutions, I find that, you know, regardless of uh, what the attention span is, a document that you can go back and refer is sometimes helpful. So that's why I've decided to share it with with uh, everybody who had attended the session, and I thank everybody for their attention. Ask how we can get the PDF. I can share that by email as well. Um, can you repeat the address of the website? 
So that will be emailed, but it's cancerview.ca, and then you have to go through a few web pages to find it, so that will be emailed. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Tripkoff for his presentation, and thank you all for attending and for your questions.